Whilst this series is concentrated on farm planning in the Hamilton district, we decided to visit other farm planners around the country to see how the ideas stand up in different conditions and different operations. The trip took in three states, South Australia, Queensland and Western Australia, as well as Northern Victoria. Brian and Max Head from the Wimmera in Victoria are farming a large wheat medic operation, which they inherited from their father. It includes this special block of remnant vegetation which they fenced off and protected against all intruders. My father attempted in his way to give me a feel for the land. That feel was brought out, I think, in the way that I've been able to preserve some 70 acres of bushland. In 67 and 68, my father and I decided to keep the stock out of it. You could see right across that entire paddock because it was a few big scattered trees. It's absolutely beautiful now. It's full of all the native species, I think, that probably would have been there before white man touched it, including native orchids. And uh, it just does the soul good to walk through that. There are moves afoot for the Head Brothers to have this bush listed under Victoria's protection covenants, to protect it permanently. There's a challenge. There's new ideas, there's new things to do. And uh, all the time there's, there's something different coming up and something that, uh, different that we can try. And all you've got to do is look around and get the ideas and really work on it. And it, it's, I guess you could just about sum that up in saying it's a way of life, but it's an interesting and challenging way of life. Satisfaction. Satisfaction. Heading west to the dry, sandy lands of the Eyre Peninsula. Here it takes a pretty special breed of farmer to succeed, with sand for soil, a 13-inch rainfall, and remnant vegetation that only grows 10 or 12 feet high. It's a pretty demanding area. And in its midst are numerous farmers who've become exceptional managers. One is 72 years old Sam Jericho, who's lived on his 800 hectare property at Rudal all his life. The first sight of Sam's property is a real eye-opener. While far-sighted people have been talking seriously about growing trees and redesigning their paddocks to land types over the last few years, Sam's been doing it for 20 years. I knew the soil types before I really started with my farm plan. We have our areas of native vegetation. We have our paddocks according to the different soil types. All of the paddocks average about 20 hectares in size. <clears throat> and uh, the planted woodlots along the fence lines have been so designed in order to cater for the prevailing winds. He set out with two main objectives. First, to plan his paddocks according to soil type to better manage each area. And secondly, to surround all the paddocks with trees to protect the soil from damaging winds. Well, initially around the homestead and around the uh, water catchment areas and that, probably we planted anything up to two, 3,000 trees in the early days. But then after I got established and the farm plan was set, and I decided to start planting along the fence lines. I planted trees around the paddock for probably a number of reasons. One is to give a better landscape effect to the whole countryside. We're also getting protection by the growing of those trees. We're distributing our valuable fauna over the whole farm. Sam's protected the remnant vegetation that's left on the farm. It amounts to 13% of the whole place, and it's mostly on the sand hills, which were difficult to farm anyway. Protecting it has prevented the normal drift of this sand on his better areas. This used to be one of those little problem areas in a U-shaped paddock. The, uh, it's the top of a sand hill, and it's very uh, poor type of agricultural soil. And what was happening was that the sheep used to walk over the sand hill and leave it bare. So what, what I've actually done is beat it off and made two paddocks of that U-shaped paddock and planted this problem area back to trees. In the centre we have 
gelatin wax and on the outside we have eucalyptus platypus and this particular area is only about eight years since I planted the trees. They've grown very well on this particular poor type of soil and the most important thing is that the problem area has just simply disappeared. He's also contained the rabbit problem with this wire mesh. In addition, he's planted about 26,000 trees to a further 7% of the farm, making a total of 20% under native vegetation. All the plantations are double fence with a mixture of species. Originally, it was low growing type of scrub and to grow tall trimbers in that type of an environment seemed rather difficult. But um, with our experimenting with Western Australian type trees, it certainly proved that they will grow here. Well, I'm quite surprised that they are growing as well as what they are. It, um, I didn't expect to see so much result in the short time that we've really been here. Sam has maintained sustainable levels of production on land which he is deeply committed to preserving. The foreseeable future will be that when you're looking at it from a distance, it's going to look like a forest, and yet amongst that forest, there's still going to be 80% of good agricultural land. You won't be able to actually see the bare ground. It'll look more like a forest. On a different tack, the crew looked at two operations in Queensland. In the southeast corner, at a place called Milmerin, Kelvin Turner runs a poultry grain operation. We've got an integrated system here that we have a uh, intensive livestock uh, industry here with our poultry and uh, we, we use the uh, poultry waste to recycle back onto the cultivations and uh, the cultivations produce the uh, grain, that's uh, the coarse grains that are needed for the poultry feed. The Turner's main income is from eggs, but Kelvin provides all his own grain from his uniquely managed cropping farm and the crop also provides added income. In 1956, the Turners had 13 inches of rain overnight, which caused serious flooding and erosion. In 1968, they experienced severe wind erosion, which sandblasted their young sorghum crop from the ground. Having always been interested in trees, Kelvin set about replanting his property based on a contour and soil type plan. To manage the water, he installed a series of dams, including this very large area to which flood water is diverted, forming a wildlife sanctuary. Kelvin has also installed a series of waterways, which are interconnected with irrigation ditches, which run along the contours of the land. Access is situated on the high part of the farm, with a single laneway circling the whole place. In addition, there's a major tree planting program around the edge of the property and along the contour banks. These provide an excellent barrier to the wind and a habitat for a healthy fauna population. I'm uh, greatly in favour of uh, using trees in conjunction with waterways. They uh, provide a natural stabilising effect on the uh, waterway floor and prevent erosion in the waterways. Whilst Kelvin uses weedicides, he refuses to use pesticides. On one occasion some time ago, he was forced to buy in grain which had residue of pesticide in it, and all his poultry became ill. There's a bit of a tradition in Queensland's Lockyer Valley that you either farm the mountain country or you farm the silted valley below. It's some of the best vegetable growing country in Australia. The Olm brothers tell of a family tradition, which has survived for three generations, of farming the hills, a time when the land was pretty knocked about. You know, the real good creek soil that was three foot deep, it was beautiful soil on top of the waterbed, was totally gone back to blue metal gravel. Gone forever. You know, gone forever, it'll never come back. A lot of it's been washed out in the Morton Bay. There's noticed there's quite a few slips and that sort of thing. I think the people have gone in knock the trees down, of course, we've got nothing to hold the soil together. And lantana takes over then. If you look where the heavy tree lines are, you can still see bare ground and cattle graze there where you come into the heavy lantana country, they can't eat. 
because it makes it real loose and the roots go in and so there's nothing to hold it together. It come from England, somebody brought it out as a pot plant and uh, it spreads right through this valley. Well, wherever there's reasonably good soil, pH of <coughs> about six, uh, it grows perfect and it'll spread. It's one of the biggest and, uh, curses we've got in this country, isn't it? Yes, Lantana is a very big problem to us out in the top country. In more recent years, they've bought some of the rich low country and have run a very successful vegetable operation. This has given them the chance to look at restoration projects back on the high country. It was fairly well washed off, very little topsoil left. Between Max Roberts, Bath, Bartholomew and ourselves, we set to work and we cultivated it, sowed a variety of grasses and uh, planted lacina. It doesn't only uh, rejuvenate the soil with the nitrogen, it's also good pasture for the cattle. This country will uh, stay here now for another two months and away it'll go. We'll put a trail load of bullocks in here and we'll bring them out as fast. They are actually using this, this lucina or loosen tree up in the mountain slips on the mountains. It is proving very beneficial and it's holding the soil together. You know, I believe too that uh, there's no more soil being made and if we don't look after the stuff we have, uh, have got, we're going to find that uh, we're going to turn up one day and it's not going to be there. Max Roberts has worked with 300 farmers or even more in the 10 years that he's been in the valley. He's adamant that the role of extension and support personnel is to listen and to adapt to the needs of the farmers they serve. The values that are really important is to recognise that the real expert is the man on his own piece of land. And to recognise really that uh, to be a good listener rather than a good talker and to take it in over a period of years and work with people. Now, farmers have a lot of time quite often thinking on a tractor. They've got ideas. They've got very good ideas. Uh, just a little bit of support and assistance. Uh, the time, which is important, and the available money right, to do things. Uh, pull those things together around a table or out in the paddock, preferably, with ideas from everywhere, and you'll find a very good plan to develop, and it will get done because it's the farmer's plan. At Tamman in the Western Australian Wheat Belt, Tony York, who's a vice president of the State Farmers Federation, is particularly interested in improving land management. The essence of it is first establish exactly what we shouldn't be doing and uh, stop doing anything that might be exacerbating the problem. And from then, we'd start developing on what alternative land uses we can, we can use, what options, what strategies that we can apply that might uh, ameliorate the problem or even um, redress it. The Western Australian Department of Agriculture is particularly active in developing farm planning models. With the department's help, Tony has mapped his property according to seven soil types. Consequently, he's refencing the place to the land's capability and altering the management of each soil type. Now, this can mean Tagasasti on his exposed hilly areas that struggle to sustain a cereal crop, or planting salt bush to his salty areas to both stop the degradation and carry rich autumn feed. And it can mean tuning his better soils to find the best rotation, like wheat medic rotation on his heavy soil and wheat and lupins on the higher land. Yeah. Well, basically, it's about self-preservation. We certainly had to, to look after the resource we've got and try and get control of our degradation problems. And, and at the same time, if we can improve our productivity and our profitability, well, then all the better. Also from Tamman are Joss and Dennis Chatfield. We caught up with Joss in Perth, fulfilling one of her numerous roles as a farmer representative in the land care issue. Soil conservation is something that it's almost like a religion with me. I feel it very strongly and I'm, I'm almost a, like a champion of farmers. You know, if I ever hear anyone run farmers down, if I ever see an article that, that talks about how the problems are caused by farmers clearing the land, I think I'm probably the first one to stand up and say, hey, you know, and give them the story about how all this happened, that we are there. Um, as business people to, you know, produce good crops and make money and we've a right to do that. And there are so many farmers out there that are actually looking after their properties and have conservation programs, but not many people know about it. 
and we've planted 100,000 trees on the farm and to some people that might seem a lot but I still think you know there's room for more um, and done in a much better way and perhaps more wind breaks and uh, you know definitely I'd, I'd like to get into this farm planning thing that that's what turns me on at the moment. Their property at Tamman is a remarkable example of tree establishment. Actually, the Chatfields have been pioneers in the business of trees. Ten years ago, they hired some contractors to plant trees for them. And it was such a miserable failure, they decided to try themselves. This was really the start of a revolution in their lives, which, amongst other things, saw Dennis devise the Chatfield tree planter. This can get 5,000 trees into the ground each day, with a success rate of better than 95%. He has a patent on the machine, and it's now in action in various parts of Australia. We have done a lot of tri trial and error, and the, uh, the errors have been uh, necessary you know, for the, the part of learning. We had contractors in to plant trees. They didn't seem to be able to do it at all, so we set about devising ways of being able to do it with better success rates. We've got about over 100,000 planted on our own place up till now, and that's taken about eight or nine years to do that. It seems to be a lot, uh, 100,000, but we look on our 7,000 acre property and you, you're, you're battling to find them. You know, we need lots more. We, 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 I think we, we should be nearly finished when we get to a million. Like so many of the farmers in this series, the Chatfields' work is really smart. It stems from a determination to understand their land better and to protect it. We've got a few sceptics and they said we couldn't use that good country up there, that good wheat growing country. But I think down the track these people you know, will become to realise that the windbreaks and shelter belts are going to come. I mean, they're not only windbreaks and shelter belts, they're using the water up. They're a part of the ecology, they're wildlife corridors. If there's no wildlife, uh, or it's going to be a pretty sterile sort of system, uh, if you don't have wildlife, you're not going to have trees. So if you haven't got any trees, you're going to finish up with a desert. Uh, I can't see any other way. Uh, you know, and if we're going to get a living out of, out of this country um, and not mine it, we've got to have the whole total um, ecology working for us. Another example of Western Australian ingenuity is the work of Ted Lafroy. He's recently completed a consulting job with the Rural Landscape Advisory Service. Working near Hopeton on the south coast, a catchment group of farmers employed his services to coordinate a land care strategy for the whole area. A mistake that was made early and a very easy one to make is that uh, the land appeared very, very flat and land's never dead flat, there's always uh, some form. Because it was so uh, apparently featureless, it was just cleared in a swathe in a lot of cases. Um, and there are some stories of where bulldozer drivers were actually given compasses and, and told, I want you to go on this bearing till midday and then turn through 90 degrees. Uh, and that was a very acceptable way of clearing it. What became apparent later were the underlying form of the land, particularly the drainage patterns. Uh, and the fact that, that the land was divided up into blocks without any concession to the drainage and to the form of the land has meant that there are problems now that, are, that have to be overcome. In this particular catchment, there were problems with uh, salinity, which, uh, as in most of southern Australia, had come about because the deep-rooted perennial vegetation had been removed, uh, the annual crops and pastures that had replaced it weren't using this, all of the rain that fell, there was an addition to the underground reservoir. It rose at the bottom of the valleys, causing salinity. Um, the idea in this case was to, to um, get as many farmers in the catchment to pay for the consultancy service themselves. And so each eight farmers in this catchment of 17 contributed $500 each for an initial study. And that really amounted to ferreting around existing information on the underlying geology, the soil types, drainage patterns, and a visit, several visits to each of the properties to draw up a basic plan of, of the land as it was then and identify what areas were becoming saline. And by doing that, we were able to ignore, in some cases, the property boundaries and understand the pattern of salinity and how it related to drainage 
and then the problem could be tackled by several farmers at once. Very simply, the, the, uh, what prompted them was, was the shock of seeing uh, the water tables rising, of physically seeing them. Um, some bores had been drilled in the area. They were asked once a month to go out and, and dip them, to measure the level of salt water. And when they could see the water table rising, even in only a matter of centimetres, but to actually physically see it, that was the shock that often started a lot of this off. And I think there's a, there's a good analogy with this in what's called the, the frog in hot water principle. You drop a frog into cold water on the stove, turn the stove on, the frog will stay there till it's cooked. You drop a frog into boiling water, it'll leap straight out. Uh, you can, if people have been sitting in a situation and gradually getting used to it, I think you can stay there until the situation becomes desperate. If it's brought home in a very, almost a brutal way, you get a, you get a reaction, and a very positive reaction. You jump out of the water. The last two farms which the crew visited were in the south of Western Australia, near Esperance. Bob Stead is replanting his country according to land types. He began planting trees in 1962 to beautify his place. And this kind of whet his appetite for farm planning. In 1962, we were planting trees down the driveway and one of my neighbours came in and said, you're wasting a tremendous amount of money and time and effort in planting tree these trees. And uh, I said, well, I like trees and I'm planting them. Anyway, he sold his farm and he came back as a salesman some 10 years later and commented how lucky I was to have such lovely trees down the drive. The farm had many problems and needed, really, a complete rethink. All the fencing at first start was done on the square to get approximately 70, 80 acre paddocks. And uh, we fenced, double fenced for trees uh, along these lines. They went through swamps, through um, wet areas, uh, from sand to deep gravel onto clay. Um, no worry about soil types at all. Uh, totally wrong. Having developed an affinity with his land, Bob is redeveloping the place based on a 20-year plan. Fencing to soil types, tree shelter around the boundaries of all his paddocks, and tree-lined waterways on the contours to drain his salty areas. As if you've gone round the farm, you've noticed the lines of trees go from oh, very large bushy trees down to small spindly trees as, we've, as they've crossed the soil types. So I think we'll actually grow better trees as well as maybe getting better production from our land. And you must plough back whatever you don't need to live on. Uh, we can get very large income some year. Um, and I think we've, we've got to salt some of that away, I agree, for the bad years. Um, I don't believe that we should wait for the government to help us out of every little hiccup that we have. Also near Esperance, Gary English left the police force and bought this grazing property. It was land which had only recently been opened up to farming, but in 10 years it had been literally ruined. It just, just became a matter of survival when we came here. It was farmed conventionally and the first few years the paddocks used to blow away as you cropped conventionally. Um, there was never enough feed for the sheep in the autumn. Um, you had to change the system there. And I could just see that the, the system just wasn't right for this, this soil type in particular. We brought um, traditional wheat belt methods and tried to implant them on this fragile sand plant. And that just doesn't work. It was watching his farm blow away that forced him to question how best the land should be managed. There's a lot of trial and error, but uh, you know, if you see your paddock blowing away, you've got to do something about it. <laughs> and there's no worse feeling than you know, sitting in the house and you find a howling gale around in the dust going over the top of you. and you know, It's the most depressing feeling, it really is. Gary's approach to the farm has been pragmatic and efficient and always based on the best use of the land so as to sustain it. Very hard, hard to explain to a, a fellow farmer, but uh, I, I farm by soil types for one, one reason. Um, you, you're unproductive ground, and every farmer has got unproductive soil, and whether it be saline or waterlogged type country or deep sand that's totally unproductive for conventional farming, don't farm it. As simple as that, and fence it out. The first thing to do is to fence it out. 
and it will never cost you any more money. And then if you like to, you can then try and redress some of the problems on our country by planting trees or um, regenerating wildflowers or whatever you like to do on that country if, if that so turns you on. But at least it's not cost you anything and nature in many cases will revegetate that country anyway and get back to some sort of balance. So I think that was one of the first things that we found is not to farm our non-productive ground because you know, there's a lot of cost in fertilising that country, putting chemicals on it or whatever it might be. So as soon as you take that out, it's not costing you anything. As an experiment in the early days, he planted barley in this paddock. It completely failed, so as good as his word, he let it go, so at least it couldn't lose him money. It regenerated into a fantastic Banksia area. And today, the English family market these valuable wildflowers in Perth and on international markets. We've set about draining the place, putting in windbreaks, we've uh, put in silage to overcome the autumn feed gap. We conserve a lot more feed now and we, we actually plant grass in, in our paddocks, which a lot of farmers, when you're trying to crop, it's the last thing you would do. You try and get rid of all your grasses and you end up with pure clover and, of course, come autumn, blows away on you. If you were to summarise Gary's management, the aim is to maximise his production by reading the land's capability and taking the necessary steps to protect the soil resource. The wind erosion is virtually nil. Um, we had a tail end of a cyclone come through here last, last year and uh, it's actually held the ground. We came out on the cyclone and for 100 metres out from the pines there was no dust lifting at all and then from there on there was a little bit of dust rise. Yet in the open paddocks this place was just as though it was on fire. And Gary's understanding of his land has not passed unnoticed. Last year he was named Western Australian Farmer of the Year. Well, I'd, I'd say nature is very, very cruel if you try and work against it. And uh, if you can try and work with nature, you, you're home and host. And I think we've proven that the last two or three years. We're having a very good time, really. And uh, I know some of the neighbours and people around the district that are still batting against nature and uh, they've had a very hard time. So I think there's only one way to go and that's with nature. The farmers we've looked at in this film are pretty remarkable people. Unlike the potter demonstration farmers, they've had no subsidies to help make the changes in their places. Although in most instances, they had excellent government extension support. Each in their own way, observed the deterioration of their land and each adapted their management to incorporate protection mechanisms, what we're calling sustainable agriculture. In doing so, more often than not, they became better farmers and their productivity improved, despite the land that they took out of production or the initial cost they incurred in making the changes. These farmers, and many more like them, are the real pioneers of a new phase in Australian agriculture as we come to fully understand this land's needs and to match production with ecology.